So as I think everyone in this audience knows, you've written some remarkably brilliant and famous speeches uh, for a former <laughs> first lady. Um, how, I, I just love to know, how, how did you end up on this path? Like, I'd never heard of speechwriter as a job. How did you I get know. there? I there's no, it's not like law school or med school where there's kind of a path and a trail. There's no like speechwriting school. Um, so I actually interned in Vice President Al Gore's speechwriting office when I was in college. And the speechwriters I worked for helped me get my first job after college, which was to be uh, the assistant to a speechwriter for the Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. Um, I commuted three hours a day. I sat in a windowless cubicle right next to the bathroom, and I was completely miserable. So that job lasted around nine months, and then I got a job writing for a senator from Iowa named Senator Harkin, wonderful guy. Uh, I didn't know how to write speeches then, like at all. So I kind of like fudged my way through it for a year, and I remember his chief of staff took me aside in May, and was like, we really think it would be great if you went to law school. Like we know you've applied, and we think you should just go. We think you'd be great at just not this. Um, so I, you know, I went to law school thinking like, that's it. I'm gonna get a real job, I'm gonna grow up, speech writing thing is not for me. And then I met a guy named Josh Gottheimer, who is now a Democratic congressman from New Jersey. We became friends, and he had been a speech writer for President Clinton. So the two of us started freelancing together, and then for my third year of law school, he actually called me, he got called to work on General West Clark's primary campaign in Arkansas. And he convinced me to come down and work with him on that campaign, despite the fact that we were law students at, in Boston, like in Cambridge at Harvard. And Arkansas is obviously not very close to Cambridge, so we we're not great class attenders, but we did this. Um, we flew back for exams, it was all okay, and then Clark lost. And then Josh got a job on the Kerry campaign in 04, and I came with him, and then Kerry lost. And then I was a lawyer for a while, and then Hillary Clinton was looking for a, speech, a chief speechwriter, and Josh came to me and he said, I think you should apply. And I said, no way, totally not qualified, can't do it. A month later, he came back and he's like, really, they're still looking, you should apply. And I was like, this woman is brilliant. She's amazing. I'm not qualified. By the way, I've now been deputy chief speechwriter for two presidential campaigns, but still convinced I'm not qualified. And so then Josh finally came to me again a month later and said, look, maybe we could work out something where there's like co-chief speechwriters. So why don't you apply and maybe that, that could work. So I did, and I got the job. And Josh called me and he said, yeah, the co-chief speechwriter thing didn't really work out, but they want you to come and be the chief speechwriter. So worked on that campaign, and then she lost. So just to pause, at this point, I've now had two failed jobs and three losing campaigns. So I don't know if anyone's like, wow, that's a marker of success. This one is totally going to shoot to the top. Um, but then I got, two days after Hillary conceded, my friend John Favreau, who I had worked with in 2004 on the Kerry campaign, called me. And he said, look, I'm really I'm sorry about how, you know, I, I hope you're doing okay. I know this must be a tough time, but would you consider coming to write speeches for then-Senator Obama? And I said, yes, obviously, in a heartbeat. And went to work for Obama, and he actually won, which was like very startling to me. I did not realize that was <laughs> totally possible. Um, so, and on that campaign, I had helped Mrs. Obama with her convention speech, which was an amazing experience. You know, I was there to write for him, and that's what I mainly did. But I helped her and got to know her, and really came to like her. So I went to the White House, was writing for President Obama, and Mrs. Obama would kind of, you know, ask me to help out with things occasionally. And I just ended up doing more and more for her until I finally ended up being full time for her. So, this, so basically, so how did I get to be where I am? Like, I don't know, failure, loss, I don't know, just kind of keeping on trying things and, and not getting discouraged, my general advice. Were you, though, I'm, I'm curious, like going way back, were you writing from age three, published your first novel at six? Like, did you always know you were going to be a writer, or was this not, out of that field? No, um, you know, I, I worked on my school newspaper and literary magazine. I was always a good writer. I knew I wanted to win politics. That I absolutely knew for sure. Like that was my thing. My eighth grade class took a trip to Washington. I remember telling my Latin teacher, I'm coming back here, I'm gonna work here. But I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I think what I discovered at age 22 was you can either answer phones or you can, if you can snag one of these speech writing type gigs and you can convince someone to let you do this, you could do that. And that happened to be what I did. Um, and even though I wasn't very good at it, I realized like I liked that role. You know, when you're a speech writer, you're kind of at the heart of the action. Even if you're 22, if the, any time the senator or the whoever is saying something, you're involved. You're on the plane with them when they travel. It's a really exciting way to see any kind of political office. I, I do have to ask. So you are a speechwriter. You had a chance to give a speech today. You did not write one. <laughs> Why? Because I thought it would be more fun to talk to you. I just thought it would be more interesting, more engaging. You know, I thought about giving a speech because I was 
when Adam first asked me to do this fresh out of the administration, I was a little nervous, like, what if I say the wrong thing? And then I realized, like, I'm no longer responsible, you know, I'm no longer <laughs> speaking on behalf of the Obamas. I speak only for myself. So then I thought, like, I can just have a conversation. You can say many wrong things. Exactly. Well, I can say them all, and only I am uh, imperfect by that. So how did, how did you learn to write for somebody else? I think a lot of us struggle even to write in our own voices. How does that work when you're writing in somebody else's voice? So this is, you know, people often ask me this, and the, the thing is, if I said to any of you guys, you know, write me a brief speech about this issue in the voice of, and think of someone you know really well, a parent, a friend, a sibling, a roommate, you could probably kind of do it, right? You can kind of mimic the way the people you know and love talk. And the reason is because you've spent a lot of time talking to them. It's like you're just really familiar with their voice. Like, how often do you hear your mom's voice in your head telling you what to do or not to do? Too often. Yes, exactly, right, me too. So. Sorry, was that a question? <laughs> So true, um, but you know, I so the way to get to know someone's voice is to spend time with them. You know, look, if someone's written a book, if someone's given a lot of previous speeches, it's a good idea to read those. Um, and I remember doing that on the plane from Washington D.C. to Chicago when I was joining the Obama campaign. I was reading Dreams for My Father and thinking, Oh, I am so screwed. This guy is <laughs> amazing. Like, what have I done? This is like a novel. It's beautiful. Um, but just, I think over the years, spending time with Mrs. Obama in informal settings where we're just talking. She's just telling me, here's what I want to say in this speech, and it's very conversational. She's not giving a speech. That's how I think I've gotten to know her voice. So I'd, I'd love to hear about your writing tips. We, we all write, um, whether it's emails or term papers or speeches or anything that requires communication where we're not sitting face to face. Right. And I think that there's, there's a lot you can share with us. Do you have favorite tips, um, favorite myths? Things yeah. we should know? So there are three main tips that I share with everyone that I think are really important. The first is just to say something true. Um, I think people often, they think like, what will make me sound smart, witty, or powerful, or you know, what does the audience want to say? Those should not be your first question. Your first question should be, what is the deepest, most truest thing I can say at this moment? Um, you know, I th if you think about Barack Obama's speech in 2004, his convention speech, he started that speech by saying, let's face it, my presence on this stage tonight is pretty unlikely. Wow, well that's some truth he just dropped, like, just, you know, moment one, yeah, I get it. All of you out there are thinking that it's unlikely that a black guy named Barack Hussein Obama is on this stage. And when someone says something that's just so glaringly true, you just, you believe them, right? You give them a lot of credit, you kind of trust them. So say something true. The second thing I would say is just like, talk like a person, which seems so obvious, but, you know, you see people who they just get up on stage and they kind of lose their minds and they start to give a speech and it's very fake and stilted and you just, it's kind of embarrassing. You see it in business when people are like, I'm here to catalyze the leveraging verticals to unsilo, the, it's like, I don't, I don't know what you do. Um, or you see it in politics when it's like, we need to put hardworking middle class American family values first. It's like, this is not, this isn't, you would never, I would never say that to you. It's like, oh, Adam, hey, we're at a bar. You know what we need to do is put, it's like, oh, <laughs> talk this way. And so just, you know, talk like a person, just be normal. If you wouldn't say something to one person, I wouldn't recommend saying it to many people. Um, the, <laughs> these, I know, guys, this is deep. We're going really deep here. Um, the last tip, this is more technical, but I actually think it's a really powerful and important tip, is show, don't tell. I think most of the time when you're bored at a speech, it's because the person is telling you a lot instead of showing you. So what I mean by this is, um, this is the story of my friend John, version one. My friend John is super obsessive. He's like really neurotic, really exacting. He wants everything exactly the way he wants it. It's just, I mean, he's just, he's really compulsive. Okay, that's fine. Uh, the story of my friend John, version two. I left my friend John alone in my kitchen for 20 minutes. When I came back, he had rearranged my spice rack by alphabetical order and was arranging all the condiments in my refrigerator, my refrigerator by the expiration date. Okay, you kind of have a sense that this guy is like a little neurotic, a little exacting. You actually see him as opposed to just being told about him. I think that uh, Mrs. Obama did this really beautifully. She spoke at Dr. Maya Angelou's funeral a, couple of years, a few years ago. And you know, she was making the point that as a young black girl growing up in South Side of Chicago, she didn't have a lot of role models of black women in newspapers, magazines, on TV. There just weren't a lot of images. And so Dr. Angela was a really important role model for her. And she could have gone on and on and said, it was really hard. I felt like I didn't see myself represented. I felt invisible. It was tough. But instead, what she said was this. She said, growing up, my first doll was a Malibu Barbie. One sentence. So what do you all see in your head? You see an image of a little black girl playing with this like blonde, horrible doll. And you kind of have a sense like, this is awful. And this is like, what is this doing to this child? You really see it and feel it as opposed to just having some string of adjectives that vaguely alludes to it. 
Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the process like? Like mm -hmm. you, you have to write a speech, you have a blinking cursor staring at you or a blank sheet of paper, and then suddenly it's this magnificent <laughs> work of art. That's exactly it. It's amazing. I'm no. so talented. No. Um, it's what like happens in between? It's not like that at all. Um, you know, every speech, if you're writing for a really amazing principal like Barack or Michelle Obama, is that you sit down with the person who you're writing for and you say, what do you want to say? What do you, what do you want to say? And I will tell you, you know, Mrs. Obama knows who she is and she always knows what she wants to say. So she would say, well, here's what I want to say. And she would just lay it out. She would lay out exactly the ideas she wanted to talk about the themes she wanted to hit. She'd say a lot of the language she wanted to use. So my job was really to take basically a transcript of that. Like I'm a very fast typer, which turns out to be one of the most important job qualifications for a speechwriter. So I would really take that, that, that input was the heart of the speech. That's what I started with. And so, you know, I might do some research on my own. I might talk to some people to get some more information, but then I would come up with a draft I would send it around to my colleagues just to kind of get their input. You know, I would send it around to our policy people. You know, is the policy right in here? To lawyers, are there any legal issues? To communications people, is this any flags here that's you know could be problematic? Fact checkers, very important. White House, I mean previous White Houses, um, were really were really into fact checking. Every word of every line of every speech I ever wrote was rigorously fact checked to a point that often drove speechwriters crazy, but that I'm really grateful for because we wanted to make sure that everything we were saying was true. So then, you know, I get her a draft, and it's just a lot of editing, very, very heavy editing, back and forth. It's really a process, and then it's given. So it's, you know, it's really hers from start to finish. Is the truth? At what point do you start reading it out loud versus doing it on paper? Yeah, this is a, you know, um, writing to be heard versus writing to be read. They're two different, very different art forms. So I think if you looked at a draft, you know, if you looked at one of my speeches, even the final draft, you'd think like. Someone who doesn't have a lot of command of like punctuation and grammar, right? Like it's just they're they're not they seem weird, but if I read it to you, it would actually sound really good. So, you know, I think that once you have a good enough draft, that's when you should start reading it out loud just to hear what it sounds like, to feel it. And you'll if you're doing this reading, you'll you'll feel like this part is slow, or this part or this sentence is like way too long and it's too hard to say. So we sometimes do that with her and she read it and we can kind of be able to hear like this part works, this part doesn't. What do you do when you disagree with the person you're writing for? You know, I don't. Which is generally my policy. I, I will only write for people with whom I agree. That's just my rule. And I think you'll find that of most political speechwriters, you know, we're really in this because we have a certain set of values and beliefs that we want to promote. We're not just in this to write. Um, you know, I will say I once worked with someone who, or worked for someone who he had written for someone where he was very anti death penalty and she was very pro death penalty. They, the only issue they disagreed on. So he had an agreement with her that if she ever wanted to talk about the death penalty, he just wouldn't write it. That was the rule. I think you can maybe do that with one issue, but you can be like, all right, so on healthcare and taxes, and it's just like, you gotta, I wouldn't do it with more than one issue, but I would generally recommend writing for someone you agree with. What about more micro-level disagreements? So you think there's a more effective way to say something, or you know, you have a different point of view about what to emphasize. Right, and, and you know, it's funny, I think that the reason I work so well with Mrs. Obama is we share such a sensibility about what makes a great speech. So I can't really think of a time where she wanted to say something a certain way and I was like, well, that's not good. I mean, it was always, she'd want to say something a certain way and I think that is so good. Like that's so much better than what I would have come up with. But I think that, you know, your job as a speechwriter, it is to actually push back on your boss if they want to say something that's not effective and to just kind of suggest, hey, you know, here's a better way. But at the end of the day, it's their speech, not yours. At the end of the day, they're the one who has to walk up to that podium, give that speech, either get the claim or the criticism for it. And so that's, you know, at the end of the day, they have to make that call, not you. Sarah, there was a, an amazing profile of you months ago now, <laughs> which, you know, it, it, I, I'm gonna paraphrase this, but it, it quoted uh, Michelle Obama saying, like, working with Sarah is like hearing my own voice better. Really? Something like that. <laughs> and I and you didn't read it. <laughs> yeah, I guess <laughs> right. not. Um, I'm curious about how, how you knew that this was somebody that you were going to connect so well with, mm -hmm. and then what you learned about building a relationship over time. Yeah, you know, it's funny, the first time I met her was, you know, I just, you remember, I was on the Hillary campaign for 17 months before the Obama campaign, and you guys were all probably like eight at the time, but it was, that was a really tough campaign. Like, they were very, I actually just wrote about this in a piece I wrote about in Boston Globe, like, that was a really toxic primary. I mean, they were just hitting each other nonstop, back and forth, it was very tough. So when I showed up in Chicago, and they were like, yeah, you know, you're just gonna work with Ms. Obama on her speech, it's totally fine. I was like, whoa, hey, I don't, I don't know if she's gonna be super excited to see me or you know, have me on board here, maybe we should wait, I don't know. They're like, no, 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 it'll be fine. And I think the first time I met her, 
I just was struck by how kind she was and how warm she was. There was no hostility. There was no closed kind of keeping me at the distance. She wasn't suspicious. She was just warm and open and kind. And I just thought, man, this is a big woman. Like this is really big of her to be, to just be able to rise above this, to forget the past 17 months, to trust that I was there and that I was there in good faith and to kind of trust me in that moment. So that to me was, or sorry, that was a very moving kind of moment. And I think as I talked with her more and more about what she wanted to say and talked about her family, like her family, we've had totally different experiences in America, Michelle Obama and Sarah Hurwitz, but when she talks about growing up in her family and how her parents were like obsessed with education and that was everything and getting to college was everything, I hear the story of my family. That was what my family was like too. And I think there are a lot of similar values and ideas about about America and about how you live in the world that we share and I think that was clear early on. Would you go so far as to say then before you're gonna work with someone that you wanna compare your childhoods? <laughs> um, not, I, mean, I don't think it's like mandatory. If you can, I think that would be good. But uh, I do think it's important to really know who they are. You know, I would really kind of advise some pretty deep research on someone before you agree to write for him because it's a very intimate position. You're going to be spending a lot of time with this person. You may be, you know, I've traveled the country and the world with Mrs. Obama and I adore her. You know, this, this amazing, funny, smart, warm, brilliant woman that you see on TV, that's the same woman who I saw in a room in the White House, on an airplane, in wherever we were, in whatever part of the world. And I, I can't imagine doing the job with someone who I didn't love as much as, as I love her. I wonder, it, it, as I think about this, it has to be weird to hear your words, though, coming out of someone else's mouth and moving people. What, what is that like? Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of times people kind of think, like, don't you get mad when you get credit, when they get credit for what you wrote? Um, the truth is, it's never what I wrote. You know, it's really, it's always such a collaboration that I don't feel like <laughs> she's getting credit for something that I wrote. I think it's really her words. And the truth is, after you've done this for a while, it isn't really that weird. It's mainly just stressful. I find it very stressful to watch people deliver speeches that I've worked on because I'm only I'm only hearing the parts that aren't working. I'm only hearing the line they stumble over. I'm hearing the audience or or not hearing the audience applause. Like something that I thought you know when I I can tell when an audience isn't responsive. You guys are a very responsive audience, which I appreciate. But um, some some audiences are not, and that's really hard for a speaker. So when I'm in an audience, I'm like the crazy person who's like clapping and laughing and trying to get them energy. I just I know how hard it is. So that part is tough. And what does an ideal audience actually do? An ideal audience, okay. Just take note. Um, <laughs> that, right there. Yeah, good. Right. Like, Keep going. An ideal audience like laughs. They're kind of with you. They're engaged. You know, they clap when there's an applause line. A not ideal audience is like people are like shifting around a lot, talking, kind of anything that's like you're not present with the speech. I notice that when I'm watching Mrs. Obama give a speech because I'm like, no, pay attention to her. Like it's it's, and she never seems distracted. Like she just is in her zone doing her thing, but it's very distracting to me as, as someone who kind of is like worrying about her. One thing that a lot of people seem to find tricky about speaking mm -hmm. is laughter is the only visible feedback that you yeah. really get. When somebody laughs, you're like, okay, I know I said something that was funny, they were with me. Right. And if you were trying to inspire someone, you'd be like, they could look like they're a zombie, and you have yep. no idea right, what, what's going on in their head. Totally. If you were hoping to educate them, you don't know whether they're learning something, what, what can you teach us about how to read our audiences better and, and how to pick up those invisible cues? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a difference between bored quiet audience and rapt quiet audience. Um, rapt quiet audience is generally like, they're kind of looking at you. Like they're actually, they actually look like they're awake and alert and kind of with you. Bored quiet audience is like looking at their iPhones or just kind of checked out. Like you can kind of feel the difference. I think you can feel when an audience is really deeply with you. And I've definitely seen speeches that Ms. Obama has given where the audience is just really quiet, but they are deeply with her. I mean, I think, I remember her speech in New Hampshire when she was talking about the, about the misogyny that we were seeing in the election. Like, it was, that audience was very quiet at parts, but because she was very emotional, she was very, very passionate and serious, and they were quiet, but they were totally with her, and that I could tell. So you, you mentioned Mrs. Obama a number of times. Are there things that you learned from her outside of speech writing that you say, okay, this is a huge part of the kind of person that I want to be, or this is something that I never realized that more people ought to do? You know, she has this relentless authenticity about her where she's just, if she doesn't believe it, she's not gonna say it. You know, she is always telling you the truth and she just, she really sticks to who she is. Like she has a very strong internal moral compass and that's something I just deeply admire about her and as I try to make my way in the world, I really try to kind of think like, okay, this thing that someone is telling me that I should do, like 
does this feel right to me? You know, does this does this feel like fake for me to be doing it? If it does, I'm probably not going to do it. I think that's the way she really approaches the world as well. So let's talk a little bit more about you then. Um, you, you made it pretty clear at the beginning of our conversation that uh, you feel some degree of imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. right? Like, what, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. Why would anyone want to listen to me or have me write for them? At what point in your career will that go away? Um, I'm going to say never. It's probably like the, you know, I think, you know, I think it's always kind of with you when you're operating at this kind of high level where it's like, you know, you're kind of, we always used to say, it was sort of a joke among my colleagues, like you're only as good as your last speech. That's sort of a sense that you have. I remember one of my colleagues once saying to me, why is it that every time I sit down to write a speech, it's like it's the first time I've ever done it? You've been writing for like a decade at this point. You know, I think it's, there's just a sense that like, you're always proving yourself. You're always kind of building. You're always trying to do something more. And I think, you know, you can't, you have to have confidence. I think without confidence, you will be totally lost as a speechwriter. You know, I think where speechwriters and principals get in a really bad place is when like, the speechwriter starts out and they're not, by getting the principal's voice, and then the principal is frustrated and kind of doesn't like them, and then that makes the speechwriter more anxious, so they become more risk averse and more afraid and kind of more stilted, and the principal likes it even less, and it kind of spirals into this terrible cycle. And even really good speechwriters who have good relationships with their principals, you can get into that spiral once in a while, where you start to lose confidence and feel like you're just not doing it, and you're writing kind of a few bad speeches, and it starts to feel like, have I lost my touch? Like, have I, am I no longer able to do this? And the only way out of that is to write a good speech, which is terrible, right? Because you're feeling pretty awful and it's hard, but like the only way out is just to, it's just, it's to get yourself out of it with a good speech and you just kind of have to have the faith that you can do it. I think you just said that feeling like an imposter is a source of motivation. Yes, it kind of is. It actually kind of, it, it is. I think, if, I think if I always felt, if I felt like I was awesome and just so great, I don't, I, I don't know. I think that would, I would lose motivation. You know, I think there is this, I was just telling someone like, there is a certain discomfort that you have to be able to tolerate when you write these speeches. Even when I was working on Mrs. Obama's 2016 convention speech, I really struggled with that speech because she had such a clear vision. She knew exactly what she wanted. She had laid it out for me, and I just was struggling to execute it for, some, for a while. Like There were a couple days where I just I couldn't get it, and that was so miserable. Because it's just this feeling of like, what if, what if I don't get it? What if it doesn't happen? What will happen? And it, you have to be able to kind of tolerate that discomfort because at some point, it works out, right? The muses come, you, your, your writer's block breaks, and it's okay, but it's tolerating discomfort is kind of part of being successful. I'm sure you've seen this as you're writing books and doing all this stuff. Like, you do have to have that tolerance for risk. That, that is something I wanted to ask you about. So how many people in this room procrastinate? <laughs> <laughs> Not a necessary question to ask, but um, I, I, was, I remember being so surprised when, when writing originals um, that not only do, does every writer procrastinate, but that some of the greatest speeches in American history came out of that, right? Like the, the MLK, I Have a Dream speech, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, um, refined and even improvised almost at the last minute. Um, is there a way to make less of that happen and to sort of accelerate the arrival of the muse, as you described it? Yeah, it's sort of funny. Like, I, you know, like we did not do a lot of last minute things in the, in the first lady world because, you know, a president has to respond to things, right? There's, there's always things happening. There's a lot of last minute stuff that comes up. But a first lady, if there's some sort of crisis, no one goes to the first lady first to figure out what to do. You know, she's, she's more proactive. So actually, you know, I think, I think having a process where you just, you know, like, okay, three weeks in advance, we're gonna start thinking about this and we're gonna have a schedule whereby, okay, the first draft's gonna come at this point and then the second draft is. Like, I actually think scheduling out deadlines is very, very helpful, especially if you have someone and some mechanism to enforce them. I think that's kind of the key. I think lack of deadlines is like the fuel of procrastination. That's, that's what lets it happen. And how are you dealing with that now that you don't have to deliver? It's really tough. I gotta tell you, like it is, it's tough. You know, when I write, I've written a few pieces in my own voice and it's like, you know, it's very easy to just kind of decide to put it aside and like, okay, maybe I'll look at this in a few days. I think the one thing that helps, frankly, is timeliness in the news. You know, when something comes up, I mean, you know, I wrote my first piece about fact checking in response to Sean Spicer's first press conference. I didn't say that, but there was certainly this story in the media right now that was like, wait a second, untrue things are being said. And so when I'm writing a piece about fact checking and the importance of saying true things, like I shouldn't wait a week on that. You know, I kind of knew I had to get this out there. So actually it's sort of the, the news cycle I think provides the deadline sometimes, but longer term projects, yeah, it's gonna be tough. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, so I, I, every writer I know has some quirky habits that help with that. Um, I guess like for, for me, it started in college when I would take my favorite TV shows and I would give the tape to my roommate and say, like, if I don't finish writing, destroy the tape. <laughs> and I was really mad, right, when, when it happened, but like not so mad that it ruined my life. And it was a great source of motivation. What, what are your quirky habits for motivating yourself? I think like the fear of disappointing others is kind of a good motivator. I think like, you know, when... That's a much more noble motivator than mine. <laughs> <laughs> TV, yeah. <laughs> tell people, hey, I'm working on this piece, and then like, and then I, they'll kind of like check in with me, and I'll feel embarrassed if I haven't done it. So I think actually telling other people in, in shame can be really helpful. <laughs> it's a powerful motivator. Uh, do, you, do you have people that you're especially worried about disappointing where you deliberately make these announcements, or is it just something that happens over there? It's just sort of something that happens. I, you know, I have my, my former speech writing colleagues are amazing. Anything I write, I send to them, and they'll sort of send me edits. And sometimes, you know, I send them something, and they send me edits, and I'm hesitating. They'll then ping me the next day and be like, hey, has it come out yet? I'm like, oh, I haven't. And then it's sort of embarrassing. I'm like, well, I haven't sent it. And they're like, well, why not? I'm like, all right, all right. It's a good, it's a good motivator. So there's a lot of talk now about how divided our country is. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what a speechwriter can do about that. If you, wanna, if you wanna write a speech, deliver a message that's going to reach people across a spectrum, um, what are your thoughts on how to do that? So I've been talking a lot about how to channel the principal's voice, but a lot of what Mrs. Obama and President Obama were doing, at every speech they're doing, they're telling other people's stories. Whether they're actually saying, I met so-and-so who does such and such, or whether they're doing it in a less explicit way, good speech writing is telling the stories of the people to whom you speak and the people you serve. So I really think that part of how we bridge this divide is really, it is like learning people's stories and telling them in really vivid and moving detail. You know, I think, a lot of times I will start out speeches by saying like, hey, it's great to be here today, whatever, and they'll say like, you know, I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Like, I know, I know what you guys are doing. You know, I've heard about how you did this thing. Maybe you're a bunch of high school students. You know, I, heard that, I hear that you guys have all gotten yourselves into college. That's amazing. Whatever it is, it's like having your principal really recognize the audience and tell their story. And maybe that audience has very little in common with the principal. Maybe that audience is very skeptical of the principal. But I think that when that audience hears that the principal has taken the time to learn about them, has taken the time to really tell their story in a vivid and moving way, I think they appreciate it. And I think that's how you start to see these divides kind of break down. So as you get a more and more diverse audience, that becomes harder, right? Yeah. Especially, especially ideologically. Totally. Um, you've, I'm sure you've, you've seen a lot of the evidence on moral foundations um, suggesting that you know, often liberals are more motivated by questions of justice and care, conservatives more by questions of, of loyalty, purity, authority. Um, do you think about incorporating that kind of adjustment um, in the, the words that you put? The American Guides, you know, the American School Counselors Association, okay, that's, a, that's an audience that's there because they have a passion, they have a career, and I think it's easy to kind of talk to them about what they're doing. You know, when you're writing a Democratic National Convention speech, you're talking to America. And I think that's why I always say that political stump speeches are so hard, because you're sort of talking about everything to everyone. And you know, it's like, how, where do you even start? What do you even talk about? Um, I do think about that. I think about. I think the way you bridge those is by just like telling your story in a way that articulates values that we all share. I, mean, I think Mrs. Obama did, does this so well when she talks about growing up on the South Side of Chicago. Parents didn't go to college. Her father had multiple sclerosis, and you know, as he got sicker and sicker, he would wake up earlier and earlier so that he could have time to button his shirt and drag himself across the apartment with two canes and slowly down the stairs and to his job at this water, you know, the city water plant in Chicago, because to him, like, that's what it meant to be a man. And you know, when she got to college, she always talks about how you know, she got all these loans and grants and scholarships, so he was only paying a tiny part of her tuition, but he was so intent on paying that little tiny part of her tuition on time every semester, because he just couldn't bear the thought of her being late with her tuition bill because he didn't meet you know, his, his, what he needed to do as a father. And you know, that story, like, I think that appeals to everyone. You know, conservatives, liberals, like everyone can see their own parent, grandparent, caretaker, friend. You, you can see someone who you know and love in that story. So I think telling these personal stories like that, I think, I think that's actually a way that you kind of bridge all of those different value divides. If you think about your own life, what's the, what's the defining story? Or what's an example of that that's shaped your trajectory? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot about my grandmother, who was born in 1912. Um, you know, she was born in a tenement in the Lower East Side of New York, and you know she always wanted to go to law school and be in politics. That was like her dream, which is an unusual dream for a woman born in 1912. Um, she never got to do those things because she was a woman, because the Depression happened, and you know it amazes me 
that for the past eight years, every single day, I am someone with a law degree from Harvard and I walk through the gates of the White House every day for the last eight years. It's just two generations. You know, and I, I was actually thinking about this even more when uh, my great grandmother really wanted to move to New York so that her daughter could go to college. Like, this is a very amazing story because they had the city college in New York. And she thought, like, even though we're Jewish, even though we're immigrants, you know, we have these city college system, and my daughter could go to school. That didn't happen. But then last year, Mrs. Obama spoke at the City College of New York. And I just thought it was so amazing that like this kind of yearning in my family, you know, that like two generations later, I'm rolling up with the first black first lady of the United States. We both have degrees from Harvard and we're like rolling in and she's giving this commencement speech. So I think like that trajectory of progress over the generations, that kind of American dream story, definitely defines my family, very much defines the Obamas as well. Are you going to deliberately then have dreams that go unfulfilled if you have totally. kids? Totally. I mean, come on. What else, what else is going to motivate them? What are they going to talk about? You can't be like, I had an amazing life. Everything was fine. You, you need something. So I do, I do want to ask you about one of those dreams. I don't know that this will ever become a reality. But if you were going to think outside of politics, if you could write for anyone alive today, mm. whose voice would you most want to amplify and capture? You know, I think that Malala Yousafzai, the young Pakistani woman who is an extraordinary girls' education advocate, I love her voice. I think she is just this incredible, clear, moral voice in our world. I think she's brilliant. I think she knows how to put together words and get her message out in a way that is just extraordinary. So I, I think she has such a beautiful voice in the world. She's someone I deeply admire. And if you were to go back in history and you could write for anyone past, who would you pick? Oh my gosh, I that's a tough one. I don't. I I have, you know, who would I pick? I think FDR had a pretty great voice. You know, he had a really, he had a pretty neat voice. I think he would be someone who would be great to write for, especially in a moment of, of fear, in a moment of real national crisis and struggle. I think that would be a really exciting challenge to write for someone like him. When you describe someone as having a great voice, mm -hmm. um, is that mostly about the ability to tell a personal story and, and connect that to what an audience is going through? Is there more to it than that? I think when I say someone has a great voice, I mean they have a fresh voice. I mean they don't sort of devolve into cliches. I sort of mean that if you actually were to read their words on a page, you would know it's a person. You know, I think, I think about, I actually read Peggy Noonan sometimes in the Wall Street Journal. I rarely agree with Peggy Noonan, but man, does that woman have a voice. She has this voice, it is distinctive and it's quirky and it's, it's so vivid. She kind of grabs you by the lapels out of the newspaper and pulls you in, and, and I think that's a great voice. So I would love to open it up for some audience questions. You can submit them on Twitter, hashtag Wharton Authors. We're also taking them from Facebook for those who are on. Um, Sarah, one, one thing that I think a lot of people are, are curious about is, I guess the, the term that's being thrown around a lot is, is sort of post-factual society. Mm. Um, there's a lot of debate about what is a fact? What does yeah. it mean to fact check? What's fake, fake news? What's, where do, how do we go forward from here? Yeah, I mean, this is... <laughs> This is tough, right? I mean, it, it's tough when you have a president who says things that are patently false and says them repeatedly. You know, saying that three to five million illegal immigrants voted is false. That is not true. There is no truth to that claim. Yet he said it, and he, and he said it repeatedly. Um, this is a problem, and I think that the way we go forward is just by being totally loyal to the truth. It's by taking it upon ourselves as citizens, as exhausting as it is and as ridiculous as it seems. I think there is sort of a natural reaction of like, this is ridiculous. I'm not even. I'm not even justified. I'm not even bothered with that. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna correct that. You have to correct that. And I think we're seeing a lot of journalists doing this. I think we're seeing a lot of people in public life. It is our job to rigorously push back and say that is not true. That is totally untrue. There are facts. There are legitimate sources. There are people who have actually done research to find the truth. And it's our job to really promote those people. Uh, another question that's uh, that's popped up here is, are you likely to write for Mrs. Obama again, perhaps on a future campaign? <laughs> <laughs> so Mrs. Obama, as she has said many times, I'm not saying anything that she has not, she has said many times she's not running for office, and I believe her. Um, you know, I will always be there to help her with her, with things in the future. I, I, I adore her, and it's just the greatest privilege of my life to work for her, and I, I would love to help her with future things as well. But nothing formal. In the works. <laughs> Maybe. You never know. Not a campaign. Not a campaign. She's not running for anything. It's not happening. It's not starting the story here. It's not happening. Good. Uh, I, uh, I don't want to contribute to the rumor mill. I do want to know what you're doing now, though. Yeah, so I am a fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard, which is a great program where they have kind of six folks who have been, had political careers, who are at an inflection point in their careers where they're finishing a job or whatever, 
they come together, Democrats, Republicans, and they're just there for the semester. We teach not, I teach a non-credit study group to students. Um, I do office hours with students, I speak to student groups, and it's just a great chance to kind of reflect, decompress, um, not be in Washington, D.C., which is just a nice break. Here's a fun question from Claudel. Can you talk about influencing through non-speech the total absence of words and how that works? Whoa, that is a deep question. Um, actually, if you could just mime it for I know, us. right? <laughs> how? Um, you know, I think, I think that question gets at something very deep, which is that your body language absolutely matters. I mean, I was just talking to someone recently who does media training, and he said, you know, audiences form, when you're on TV, audiences form an impression of you within the first five to ten seconds. You've, not, you've said like eight words in five to ten seconds, but they've already formed a very distinct impression of you. So I actually think, I think you say a lot with your body language. Um, I think that you can tell an audience that you're, you actually really don't want to be there if you're kind of like this and kind of you know, backing away. I think that you can tell them if you're excited to be there, if you're leaning in, if you're engaging. So I think that body language and nonverbal cues actually can say a great deal. I also think you know, this is the art of political advance, right? This is what, what's on the stage. You know, are there a bunch of American flags on the stage, or are there not? Are there children standing on that stage behind you, or are there not? You send, I mean, our political advance people in the White House were brilliant and so talented and gifted, and they would always be the ones amplifying whatever message President or Mrs. Obama was saying. You know, maybe there would be, if Mrs. Obama was speaking about girls' education, maybe there would be pictures of girls from around the world behind her. Okay, that's part of her message, right? That's amplifying what she's saying. So that's a very important part of political speech writing. That segues nicely to a question from Jeff, uh, who says that Michelle Obama is an amazing speaker. How do you change your approach for someone who's not a gifted speaker? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm very spoiled, uh, clearly. You know, I think you have to kind of realize that some people are not comfortable delivering poetry, right? Some people are not, they don't have a really good control of their voice. And so sometimes you have to write much more straightforward, plain spoken language, because they just can't do the poetry. This case just it doesn't work for them. It doesn't feel comfortable. So, you know, more plain spoken language, sometimes shorter sentences, um, sometimes just shorter speeches. If they just really don't like speaking, it's better to kind of keep it short. It might actually be in the format in which you give them the speech. So sometimes people are really uncomfortable reading a speech because it just doesn't feel natural to them, but they're great with some bullet points. Some people are really they're good at they're not good at being on paper because you have to kind of go like this a lot, which is hard, but they're great on the teleprompter. So it might be just the format that you actually gave the speech to them in. Uh, another really interesting question from Claire. If you were going to write for a Republican politician, who would it be? Hmm. Okay. Um, you know, <laughs> I really, I think Ben Sass from Nebraska is pretty neat. I mean, I follow him on Twitter, and he is just a smart, funny, decent guy. Like, he just, he seems real. He seems authentic. He's been never Trump from the beginning, which I think is evidence of a real moral backbone. Um, he comes from a red state, so that's not actually that's not actually a cheap and easy position to have. That's a, that's a that's a position with some cost. Um, I lo I just think he really comes across as a as an authentic and interesting guy. So I think it would be him. There are several questions about um, your views on Hillary Clinton as a speaker, and um, you may or may not want to speak to this at all. Um, but do you have do you have thoughts on how she differs from Mrs. Obama? Do you have thoughts on her delivery, her execution? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think that you know. It's funny, like Hillary Clinton and Mrs. Obama, they, they played different roles at, this, at the same historical moment, right? Like Mrs. Obama was playing the role of the First Lady, Hillary Clinton was playing the role of the candidate. And as a candidate, you know, you're, you're spending a lot more time talking about policy positions and substantive things and, and really making an argument for why you should be running the country. You know, Mrs. Obama was never making an argument for why she should be running the country. That's not what she was out to do. She was the First Lady and, you know, no, no one votes for the First Lady and the First Lady does not actually get a salary. I don't know if people know that. The first day's salary is zero dollars. So this sort of volunteer position, which is fun. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think they have very different roles. And I think, you know, I obviously am really biased. I love Hillary Clinton. She is one of my heroes. I've been inspired by her since the time I was a kid. And, you know, something she said, I think it was in her convention speech that I found really moving, is she said, you know, I've spent my life in public service, and the service part is more comfortable for me than the public part. And I thought that was a really moving thing for her to say because, okay, maybe she's not the greatest political showman of all time, but she is such a great public servant. You know, she is so passionate. She cares so deeply about those issues. And for me, that's really what defines her. It's her life story. It's her biography. It's the fact that you look back to the time when she was a teenager and what is she doing? She's doing public service type things. So I really, I just, I think the world of her, you know, she and Mrs. Obama are very different, but I, I really love them both. 
Can you um, comment a little bit on how to incorporate humor into a speech tastefully? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. This is um, this is something I'm not particularly good at. Like, I don't write jokes. This is not my jam. But usually in a White House speech writing office, there's one person who's really good at this. Like John? Yeah, like John. John Lovett, great at this. David Litt, great at this. My colleague Tyler Lechtenberg, great at this. And so, you know, when the president does his White House correspondence speech, typically it'll be one of them who takes charge of it and is kind of the one running the process, bringing in jokes, putting it together. You know, Mrs. Obama doesn't generally, she didn't really start out speeches by like, hey guys, here's my funny joke. Like, she just, that's not really how she is. But I think there were times when, you know, the, when a joke would, when I was writing for the president, when I was kind of looking for a joke or some, there was some way to start something out in a light way, and I would just go to one of my colleagues and sort of just brainstorm with them, and they would usually come up with that joke. How have you dealt with gender bias when it comes to writing, writing speeches? So you know, the, the Hillary example that's most salient for me is when Nay Silver found that her approval ratings go up every time she's in an office and down every time she's running for one. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it tracks with decades of evidence right, that, that people often have a backlash against agentic, assertive, ambitious women. Um, do you take that into account in your speech writing? Do you try to adjust accordingly? Do you say, I want to change that. Like, it's ridiculous that these stereotypes still exist. Yeah, I mean, it, they do exist, they're real, they're hugely problematic. Um, I think, you know, I don't know if it's something that I consciously would think to myself, okay, this is the stereotype, I must, you know, as I write, take this, you know, keep this in mind. But I will say writing for women, I definitely am much more sensitive about anger. You know, anger, I think, in women is not well, re well received because of these biases and these double standards, so I think I'm much more, I'm just aware of that, I'm aware of when something is shading into sounding angry, I don't think that it, Helps the helps a woman speaker. It doesn't help men either, to be totally honest. But I think that women are much more penalized for it. So I think that's the main way it comes through in my writing. This is this is an amazing question from Caitlin. She wants to know if you could have one sentence of your past speeches be remembered in history. <laughs> what would it be? Oh, man. Um, you can I, use a semicolon. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be the line about how I wake up every morning in a house built by slaves. I think that line says a tremendous amount about not just the Obamas, but about us as a country. I think it's still true, even today, even in this kind of rough moment, definitely still true. So that, that's definitely the line. It's uh, hard to argue with that as a choice, <laughs> and I think, I, I remember, I mean, it's just it's one of those lines that really knocks you off your feet. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think we all know that that's how the White House was built, but never quite connect the dots. Right. How, did you, how did you come up with that? It was something that she had remarked on previously. You know, just I, I think, you know, she'd said it, I think, in a speech previously, actually. And it just, I think it was something that she just noted, or I, I can't, I, it's funny, I don't always remember where these things come from, but I remember I also gave, you know, you sometimes give tours of the West Wing to your friends, and I always tell my friends, guys, this building was built in part by slaves. Think about that fact in light of the current occupants. So it was something that was kind of always there for us. It was just a, a fact that we all kind of were aware of and very moved by, and so it just it seemed like a natural place to include it in the speech. One of the, the things that I think a lot of people struggle with in politics is the, the question of who's here for the right reasons? Yeah. Um, who, you know, who has good values versus who's trying to get ahead in some way? Um, are, there, are there insights and takeaways from all this time you spent in the White House on how to gauge whether somebody is authentic and trustworthy? Yeah. I mean, I will say, I have to say, like, in the Obama world, like, it just attracted the most extraordinary people from all over the country. People who were just really inspired by Barack Obama and just got into their cars, dropped everything, you know, came with their own, you know, sometimes really difficult life stories because they just wanted to be part of this. And I think oftentimes, you know, people who are in it for the right reason don't really care a lot about recognition. I think that's something that I've, I've come to realize. They're not so worried about their name on the thing or getting the credit. Like, they just want to get the thing done. They want to help people. That's really their, their focus. They have a, a real focus on, okay, how is this going to make people's lives better? And I find that a lot of times, the, the, just the most impressive people in politics are the people who've actually experienced the issues that they're working on. You know, when I worked for Senator Harkin, I might not have been a great speechwriter for the guy, but I really admired him. He grew up incredibly, just in a really, really poor family. His, I mean, his entire family all suffered from really serious health problems. This guy kind of had personally dealt with every issue he was talking about, and you just, you saw that in his passion. I think that's true for President Obama as well, right? He's a guy who grew up in pretty difficult circumstances, grew up without a father. I mean, he really, that informs him, and he just has this compassion and this understanding and respect for people that I, I just was really impressed by. So there are a lot of students in the audience. Um, you were a student once. I was. Uh, looking back, are there things you would do differently in how you spent your college years or law school, for that matter, that would be timely for some of the people in the room? I'm like everything. No, um, I mean, you know, 
I was really I was really anxious in college, and I just think I was so I got into Harvard, and I was like I must continue to get into Harvard, which is sort of the sense of like, <laughs> like what does that mean? That's crazy. That's totally that doesn't mean anything. Um, but I just you know I, I I was good at getting into Harvard, and I think I think it's very, I think it's very easy to try to keep being the generic best kid. Um, unfortunately, once you're into school like Penn, there's one best kid, and it's probably not going to be you. Um, and the best kid doesn't end up doing all that well. This is like the, the hard secret, I hate to break it to you, doesn't, because there's, in life you don't, you're not, like there's no best kid job, there's no best kid, there's like, there's not a job for best kid, there's a job for really good doctor, really good teacher, really good nurse, like there are lots of jobs for people who are really good at something or care about some issue, and I think college is a time to figure out like, what, are you, what do you actually care about? Like what actually moves you and inspires you? I'll tell you, when I was in law school and my friend Josh was trying to convince me to skip a semester of classes and move to Arkansas, which seemed like not maybe the most brilliant plan, um, you know, I'm really risk averse. Like, I'm not some adventurous, risk-taking person, but I think something I realized when I was trying to make that decision was that, you know, this risk, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna miss a lot of class, it seemed really scary and dangerous and unsafe. So that, that seemed like the risk. But then I started thinking about what would happen if I just kind of stayed at law school. And the truth was, like, I did fine in law school, but it was not my passion. And I think if I had just kind of stayed there, I probably would have, you know, gone to a law firm and kept on going. I wouldn't have gotten the job in the Kerry campaign because that depended on my job in the Clark campaign. I wouldn't have gotten the jobs of the Obamas because those depended on my previous jobs. I would have kept going down a path which was very impressive, very respectable, very prestigious, but was really not mine. And the more I was able to think clearly about that, the more I realized, like, this is the risk. Like, man, I'm risking losing myself versus risking losing, I don't know, some credits in law school. I mean, it, when I actually thought about it that clearly, it became clear to me that the risk was to stay in Cambridge and the safe thing to do was actually, ironically, to move to Arkansas. So I think it's really important to actually think very clearly about how dangerous is the risky thing and how dangerous is the safe thing. I've been hearing more and more people say, I want to go into politics or I want to influence policy. <laughs> do you have advice for how to get a foot in the door? Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I give this advice a little bit reluctantly because I think it's not, a lot of people can't take advantage of it, so I, I'm uneasy about it, but I, it is the truest advice I can give. I think interning is really, really important. Um, unfortunately, like, look, a lot of times internships can't pay, and if you are not somewhat financially well off, you can't do them. So I don't know, it makes me uneasy to give this advice, but the truth is a lot of people get their start in internships, and it doesn't have to be that you move to Washington for 10 weeks in the summer and pay for an apartment and do all that. I mean, that is like, very expensive, but what about, you know, if you're in your hometown, can you work for a local elected official there? Can you, while you're here at Penn during the semester, can you work for a local elected official, city council person, new mayor? Can you, you know, is there someone around here, even if it's five or 10 hours a week in their office, if you can swing it? Just getting that experience, you'll kind of get your first connection, and that'll be someone who will know someone, and they'll make a phone call for you. You know, so much of success in politics, it's just, it's like showing up at that campaign office with no job and just volunteering until someone gives you a job. And if you work, like, I think that a lot of times students who go to schools like this one kind of think, well, I, I have straight A's, I'm so impressive, like, you know, I'm kind of entitled to a, a good gig, and that's, in politics, no one really cares, which I know sounds pretty harsh, but what I care about when I'm looking for someone is like, are you really good at, at what you do? I hired my, my first deputy in the Obama administration, I hired the guy, and I literally didn't find out where he went to college until six months into the job, I just didn't, I didn't care. I saw his writing, I knew he was a talented writer. People really respected him and liked working with him and that's what mattered. So I think showing up, you know, being excellent at what you do, whether it is something totally not glamorous or something totally interesting. Um, really good advice I got is that when someone gives you, asks you for a $10 job, give them a $1,000 job. I find that that is excellent advice. I think there's growing trepidation about whether the kinds of skills that you bring to the table are gonna go away or become less important. Um, we've, we've seen news articles written by artificial intelligence that are indistinguishable, right, from at least some journalistic work. We've seen movie trailers also that were, you know, AI generated that are really scary. Yeah. They're designed to be scary, but um, <laughs> do, do, you, do you see these skills becoming less important? Do you think that creative work is here to stay as a writer? Yeah, I think I don't think they're. I, I think they're actually much more important now in this moment. You know, people say like, okay, in the era of Trump, is, is speech writing dead? No, God, we need it more than ever. I think now more than ever before, we need people articulating our highest ideals. You know, American values that we all share, like honesty, compassion, courage, optimism, determination. You know, th these are American values, even if they're not being necessarily articulated all, as much as they should right now. 
And you know, can artificial intelligence do that? Can it do it? Can AI respond to all of the myriad factors of a moment, like the Democratic Convention? I mean, I don't know if they can. I think there's something kind of inimitable and indispensable about this human process of responding in the moment and, and coming up with these speeches. I, I don't know if I, I can do it. Maybe I'm wrong and I'll be unemployed. But that's, you know, <laughs> I, I could be wrong. I hope you're right. Um, all right, let's, let's close on one question from Stacy that I was also curious about which is, uh, how did you get to the line, when they go low, we go high? That line was arrived at by Michelle Obama, who came up with it entirely on her own, and my role in that line was typing it into my laptop. <laughs> so, I had nothing to do with it. Great line, she came up with it. I remember thinking, oh, that's good, yeah, we should put that in. I had no idea that it was gonna catch on like it did. No idea. Sarah, thank you so much for joining my us pleasure. today.